Um, good morning. Uh, today's reading can be found on the service sheet. I'll be reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, um, verses 7, all the way till chapter 5, verse 20. Again, I saw vanity under the sun. One person who has no other, either son or brother. Yet there is no end to all his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of, of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has no other to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. For he went from prison to the throne, though in his own kingdom he had been born poor. I saw all the living who move about under the sun, along with that youth who has to stand in the king's place. There was no end of all the people, all of whom he led. Yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and a striving after wind. Guard your steps when you go into the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Do not be rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven, and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few, for a dream comes with much busyness, and a fool's voice with many words. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying for it, for he who has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you owe. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say for the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity but God is the one you must fear. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter, for the high official is watched by a higher and there are yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them, and what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a labourer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is a father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go, and what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. Behold, what I've seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun and few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you so much, Shilpa. 
And um, welcome, everyone, once again. It's really good to see you. My name's Johnny, if I've not met you before. Uh, very warm welcome to Christchurch Fallon, particularly if it's your first time. I'd love to say hello to you afterwards. Um, hopefully, if it's not pouring with rain, we can stick around and say hello to each other. Um, we just read, didn't we, those words, be not hasty, uh, be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. So let's pray for me and for all of us. Our Father, please, would the words of my mouth and the words of all our hearts as well be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we're carrying on our look at this uh, puzzling and interesting book, Ecclesiastes. But I'm afraid that today we need to start with some pretty sobering truths. As uh, Shilpa was reading chapter 4, I wonder what your mind went to when she read those words in verse 1. Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of the oppressed. Behold, look at, see the tears of the oppressed. God is calling us this morning to, to do that. And I wonder what your mind goes to. We've prayed for uh, those in India, um, those in the Middle East. My mind this week has gone to the, um, the ongoing migrant crisis, which was in the headlines years ago, but headlines have kind of gone a bit quiet now, haven't they? And yet the boats keep coming. Uh, people fleeing corruption, poverty, war, in the hands of brutal people smugglers, hundreds of thousands of them fleeing, tens of thousands of them to their deaths in the sea. When did you last weep for the oppressed? It's uncomfortable, isn't it? And it's particularly uncomfortable, I think, when we consider how actually we are very connected to so much oppression in the world. Even on the everyday level, if you just think about the phone in your pocket and uh, all those lithium-ion batteries that are being produced. We don't like to think about how they're produced, do we, in the, um, the cobalt mining in the Congo uh, that produces so many of these batteries in our phones, our laptops, our electric cars. 25% of the world's cobalt is mined in Congo in hand-dug mines. Uh, men and boys mining without any protection, any gear, even helmets. Uh, deaths and injuries are common and they're left to themselves. Behold the tears of the oppressed. There's not much comic relief in Ecclesiastes. There's something slightly strange, isn't there? A bit perverse about comic relief. <laughs> so many good causes, and yet, isn't there something a bit disturbing about the fact that we need comedy in order to stomach what we're seeing? But Ecclesiastes doesn't give us comic relief, it gives us reality. And ever since chapter 1, if you've been with us, we've seen how everything is vanity, or everything is vapor, it, it, it just slips through our fingers. We, we can't figure it out, we can't understand it, we can't make sense of this world that we're in. Everything is, is crooked and broken and cursed, everything. And he's already said, our writer, how, how toil is, is like this as well, and that's where he really focuses today. Toil, our, our labor, our work. Uh, yes, it includes our, our day jobs, but, but so much more than that. It, it's all of our responsibilities, all that we do, whether it's domestic or social or in church. All that we do is tainted by this broken world that we live in. And so he slows down in chapter 4 and and forces us to reflect on the brokenness, the brokenness of toil. And first up is oppression in those first few verses in chapter 4, which we read earlier as we confessed together. Confession, evil, 
no one to comfort them. And then look ahead as well to chapter 5, verse 8. Later on, he returns to, to this idea. Uh, chapter 5, verse 8, If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, don't be amazed at the matter, for the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. Don't be surprised by corruption and injustice. Someone's being watched by someone above them. It means sort of being watched out for. They've got their back. And that person's got another person above them watching out for them. There's this intricate web of people watching each other's backs, covering for each other. So don't be surprised when you see it. It's, it's sobering, isn't it? This was written probably two and a half thousand years ago. <laughs> uh, most likely, I think, in the, um, the um, Persian Empire. Then, of course, you had the Greeks and the Romans, uh, the Middle Ages, the modern era. The, ever since, every year, oppression, injustice, corruption. But our writer is, I think, also bringing it close to home. It's not only that we, we can blame and point the finger at um, despotic autocrats far away. He brings it very close to show us another aspect of the brokenness of our toil. Look at chapter 4, verse 4. Then I saw that all toil and skill and work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity and a striving after winds. How's your envy, dare I ask? Uh, a little while ago, we were with some neighbors in their back garden enjoying some drinks together. And uh, we, we were pretty embarrassed because we'd invited them to our garden um, a while ago, whenever it was that we could. And um, it's not the most beautiful, impressive garden. <laughs> um, and we went to theirs and it was like this incredible, beautiful, uh, it's like a really kind of top class um, outdoor pub garden or something. It was incredible, so beautiful, lovely. And, um, but there's a very slippery slope, isn't there? I noticed in my mind, it, it's such a slippery slope from saying, what a beautiful garden, to, ah, I slightly dislike the fact that you've got this garden and I don't. And then it's a slippery slope to, I dislike you because you've got that garden and I don't. It's a very dangerous, slippery slope, isn't it? A friend arrives at the pub, maybe, or at church, uh, looking amazing. <laughs> and it's remarkably difficult to just celebrate that. Much easier to envy their body figure or their clothes. Uh, a neighbor gets a new car. <laughs> oh, look at him. And it breeds discontentment, doesn't it? We think, oh, I, need, I need a promotion so I can keep up with him. Uh, maybe we see photos of a happy family enjoying a holiday. Oh, if only I had that kind of family. We begin to resent that family. Envy, it breeds discontentment. And the writer is saying that not only in our personal situations, but in all our work, all our toil, and, and it's so unmissable, isn't it, even at a societal level. Our whole economy is driven by rivalry and competition. Um, competition's good, a bit of competition's good, and you know, it spurs us on to excellence, and that's why sport works, and it's enjoyable. But when it takes over the whole economy, the whole way of operating... That's very dangerous. The American commentator Wendell Berry writes that it's a fact that the destruction of life is part of daily business of economic competition. Maybe you recognize some of this in your workplace. Sabotage, uh, the blame game, opportunism, stealing credit, the sour grapevine. Any of that sound familiar? The teacher's exposing our hearts, isn't he? And so next time, next time you hear of someone's um, promotion or uh, someone's new baby or they've bought a house or whatever it is, try to test yourself. <laughs> Count the nanoseconds between being happy for them and envying them. 
well, oppression, corruption, envy. Maybe this is all fairly familiar, but I think where he goes next may be a bit more surprising. Verse 7. Another problem that we're much more blind to is isolation. Chapter 4, verse 7. Again, I saw vanity under the sun. One person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there's no end to all his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. The statistics on loneliness are heartbreaking. You can have a look at the, um, I think it's the Campaign to End Loneliness websites. There have been all sorts of health studies that have shown that loneliness is worse for your health than obesity, or than smoking 15 cigarettes a day, increases the risk of heart disease, stroke, dementia. And it's not just older people. We're often aware of that at Christmas or something, aren't we? People on their own. But even younger people, a quarter of 23 to 28-year-olds say they have zero friends. I'm sure many of us can identify with that. Maybe many of us are experiencing that even right now, even if we're (laughs) regulars at church. For some people, it it may well stem from something we've suffered in the past, and so we're afraid of of opening up to others, and yet we'll be very aware that the loneliness isn't helping. For some of us, if we're honest, maybe we just prefer our own company. Maybe this last year hasn't been too hard. And we've quite enjoyed not having to serve other people very much, apart from not coughing on them. Maybe for others of us, it is connected to that that envy and that rivalry. We think, oh, I can't afford to forge relationships. I don't have time for that. My neighbors aren't doing that. My my contemporaries in the workplace aren't doing that. And if I I slow down and actually give myself to, to people, then they'll get ahead of me. It's a tragedy when fellow human beings are no longer neighbors to love, but competitors to beat. Oppression, injustice, corruption, envy, isolation. What does it all lead to? Restlessness and futility. Chapter 5, verse 10. Look, look across with me. It's chapter 5, verse 10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much. But the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. Have you ever had that regrettable feeling where you've eaten a massive meal far too late in the evening. <laughs> Maybe the oven took longer than you expected or people came round and you just went for another course and another course and pudding and chocolate and you get into bed and you just can't sleep. It's happened to me. <laughs> it's, it's regrettable, isn't it? And you think, oh, what an idiot. Um, but that, that comic image is, is a pretty serious picture here in verse 10. It, it's, it's a picture of the love of wealth, and it's a picture of of greed. It will never rest. You'll you'll never rest if if that's all you're you're looking for. You'll be restless. Love of money will never satisfy. By contrast, the humble labourer, verse 12, I think the image is, you know, a a humble labourer, a daily worker, doing his daily work, getting his daily wage, manages to get some food, and sleeps sweetly. It's enviable. The whole advertising industry is built on this restlessness, isn't it? This idea that you need what you don't have. It's everywhere. Um, Apparently, the godfather of modern advertising is this guy, David Ogilvy. 
He said that advertising is not an art form, it's a medium for information, a message for a single purpose, to sell. It's so obvious, isn't it? All the adverts, they're just trying to persuade us that we need what we don't have. Uh, we, we finally got round to buying a baby monitor for Clemmy. Um, don't worry, it's quite a small flat. We're not being too irresponsible. But um, <laughs> we thought it would be useful to have one. And um, apparently they all come with videos now, video screens. So you can see your baby. Okay, interesting, nice bit of technology. We don't need it, though. <laughs> People have managed for plenty of time without that. It happens in every area, doesn't it? Technology, phones, computers, clothes, fast fashion, property. You notice the estate agents, they always have the sign saying, time to upsize or time to downsize. Maybe it's just time to stay where you are. <laughs> <laughs> the whole advertising industry is built on this restlessness that we, we think we need what we don't have. We'll never satisfy. We'll never have peace or rest. And we experience that even though we know that actually in the end it's all futile. We can't take any of it with us. Chapter 5, verse 15. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. Emperor Charlemagne was um, one of the greatest in Europe back in the 8th, 9th century. Um, united so much of Western Europe. Um, incredibly powerful, wealthy, influential leader. And um, they dug up his grave 180 years after he died, this massive tomb, and his skeleton was still there, sitting on this throne with a crown on his head, jewellery, all his riches and wealth around him. And uh, tradition has it that... A Bible was found on his lap. There were these very ancient Gospels that were part of his tomb. And they say that his finger was pointing at one of Jesus' sayings. Mark 8, 36. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? That's verse 16, isn't it? This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. What gain is there to him? who toils for the wind, will never reach it. If the horizons of this life are all that you're toiling for, just chasing the wind, will never catch it, will never be satisfied. So I dare say we're, we're aware of this. We're all feeling this, this brokenness, the brokenness of toil, the brokenness of our own hearts. We're surrounded by this world. This is our world, isn't it? Oppression, injustice, envy, isolation. But even in this world, in Ecclesiastes 5, we get a glimmer of hope, don't we? Even in this darkness, we get glimmers of light that there can be joy. Joy is possible even in the midst of all of this. Did you notice chapter 4, verse 6? Just a little breath of fresh air in the midst of all of that. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and a striving after wind. It's a beautiful picture of tranquility. A handful of quietness. It's a pretty modest expectation, isn't it? But maybe we could look out for that this week. Just a handful of quietness. It's like a, a mini Sabbath, a little moment to enjoy God's creation, God's gifts, God's goodness. The blossom on the tree that you walk past a hundred times and never really stop to appreciate. The birds flying overhead, the, the breath of fresh air, the, the rain falling on your face. A handful of quietness. Life is gift, not gain. And so our teacher, the writer, he repeats that refrain, the similar words to what he said th three times now at the end of chapter 5, verse 18. Behold, what I've seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. 
Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his Lord and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. Don't you want that? Your heart to be occupied with joy? It's possible even in the midst of this broken, corrupt world. The gift of joy is available. It comes from recognizing that life and the things we enjoy are gifts from our good God. Gifts not gain. Gifts from the God who doesn't oppress, but the God who lifts up the humble. The God who even entered our world in order to do that and to serve us and lay down his life for all of our corruption and envy and injustice. The God who doesn't oppress. The God who isn't corrupt, but is just in every way. The God who doesn't work out of envy of anyone else, but simply out of generosity. And the God who draws near to the lonely. He, he is the one who gives us food and drink and work as gifts. And that is why the heart of this whole section, the heart of this passage, is worshipping this God. Drawing near to worship this God. Chapter 5, verse 1. Guard your steps. Humble ourselves before him. And so when God came in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ, he described his own body as the temple. He is the place where we encounter God. To draw near to him is to meet God, to listen to God, to worship God. And so the responses to Jesus were instructive. As you read the Gospels, you see some people coming to him humbly, seeking mercy, willing to listen like Mary, to sit at his feet and listen, while others come to him self-confident, proud, self-righteous. Well, now we, we don't go to the physical temple, we don't go to the physical Jesus. Instead, the first letter of Peter in the New Testament tells us that we are living stones being built together into the temple of God. We encounter God now through the experience of belonging to his people, to, to knowing him, to drawing near to him, to worshipping him, listening to him together as his people. That is how we encounter him now. And these warnings still apply. Be careful. Consider who our God is. Do we do that before we rock up on a Sunday? Do we prepare our hearts? I know I so often just forget to. It's just kind of in the calendar. You just turn up. But we're drawing near to the living God, the holy God. Let's not get carried away with dreams and ideas, many words, and forget to fear him. Verse 7, for when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity, but God is the one you must fear. It can be confusing, can't it, this language of fearing God? It can be a bit strange. I thought God was one of you, my loving father. I often find it helpful to think of the sea. Uh, I love the sea. Uh, we're going on holiday this week, actually, and hope to get in the sea every day. Um, love the sea. I'm keen to get clemmy surfing. Um, <laughs> it's going to be amazing. Um, it's an incredible playground, isn't it, the sea? It's swimming, surfing, playing. And yet, I would be a fool not to also fear the sea. It's phenomenally enormous. I've been on a boat out in the middle of the ocean, surrounded by seeing nothing but sea. It's a strange experience. It's so big and so powerful. The currents, the waves, the size of it, the scale is just mind-blowing. And so, yes, I'm going to get in the sea next week with Clemmy and play and enjoy it. But I should be mindful of the power of the sea as well. 
So let's enjoy it, but with trembling. <laughs> and in the same way, I think, the Bible expresses that we, yes, we enjoy God, but with trembling. To enjoy the gift of joy in a broken world. It means decentering ourselves and instead putting God and the worship and fear of God at the very center of our lives. But this passage is not only saying that, is it? Did you notice that this activity of drawing near to God, worshiping God, is not just an individual thing, it's not a solitary thing. Remember those verses about isolation? We're to do this together. We're called to worship God, to fear God together. We can't do it on our own. Look back at chapter 4, verse 9 with me. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who's alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. We've seen lots of connections in Ecclesiastes, haven't we, with the opening chapters of Genesis, Genesis 1 to 3. And do you remember the one thing that wasn't good in God's creation? He said it himself, it wasn't good for the man to be alone. Even though he was there in paradise with God. He wasn't designed to know God alone, but with others. We're created to relate. Created by a relational God, to know him, to worship him with others. That, of course, is the church. These verses are often applied to to marriage. It's one of the classic kind of Uh, passages at weddings and things, but it's so much more than marriage. Yes, marriage is part of marriage. It's wonderful companionship, but that's not only for married people. We're all created relational, by a relational God, needing other people. Two is better than one, and even three, he seems to be saying at the end, the threefold called three is better than two. The more, the merrier. (laughs) The more relationships, the better, the stronger we are. We're designed by God to work with others, to support others and lift others up when they fall, to keep each other warm, to be kind to each other, to support each other, to defend and protect each other. That's how we're made. Do you remember seeing all those um, signs down on the tube saying things like, be kind? They've, They've appeared everywhere, haven't they? They're on clothing everywhere as well, be kind. It's slightly strange that... Who is this suddenly preaching at us on the London Underground? (laughs) Be kind. Why? What's what's the basis for that, according to TFL? (laughs) Mm. (laughs) The Bible is saying, yes, be kind, because we're created for other people. We're created by a relational God to relate to each other. Let me tell you about a friend of mine called Matt. Um... We've known each other for years. He used to really annoy me. <laughs> um, we knew each other as teenagers and ended up at uni together, ended up at the same church. Oh, great. Um, he, uh, he used to really get on my nerves. And then um, we ended up on holiday one summer together. Um, but I happened to be reading this, this little book called True Friendship uh, by Vaughan Roberts, which is really excellent. And um, the main thing I took away from that book was a simple idea that to have good friends... We need to be good friends. And so I felt I ought to apologize to Matt because I wasn't being a good friend to him. I was basically trying to ignore him. And, um, and that was a real turning point in our friendship. And, and years later, I'm so, so grateful for our friendship. So what about us? What, what about you this week? I, I wonder if the first step like, like me, is, is to repent. To say sorry to God for our, our friendships, our inadequate friendships perhaps, or people that we're ignoring, we don't want to serve them. Everyone is made in the image of God as a person who needs relationships. 
Maybe like me, you need to say sorry to God and maybe to other people. But then the next step, I think, is to move, to move towards people. It can be so tempting, can't it, to move away from and withdraw from people. Um, people are difficult, like me. <laughs> we're complicated, uh, tiring. And yet we're called to move towards people in love. As social distancing eases, uh, maybe we ought to also try to ease our emotional distancing. Repent, move, and act. Let's, let's do this. We call ourselves a church family, and it's so wonderful, it's so beautiful, it's so good when that is reality, isn't it? When we don't just call ourselves church family, but we are church family. And just like friendship, the way to experience that is to do it. For others. Let's be the family God has made us to be, created to know him and worship him together. Let's pray. Our Father, we praise you that you are so good in every way. You do not oppress. You do not uh, bring injustice. You are not envious. You Draw near to the lonely. You are so good. Thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you that he paid for all our envy, all our corruption, everything that is evil in us. Lord, you've, you've made us to relate to other people, to worship you together, to come to know you with others. And we're so grateful for when we experience that through your church family. Uh, please forgive us and change us that we might live that out more and more to your praise and glory. Amen.